Okay, so I guess we're recording this session. Um, welcome everybody to this uh, ACE interim meeting. Um, I'm gonna check if the page down works and it works pretty well. So please read the not wells if you haven't read so. Um, and um, be aware that the meeting is under those not well. I, I guess everyone is familiar with those, so we might move quickly to the agenda. So we need a JavaScribe, a minute taker. And um, if you haven't signed a blue sheet, please do sign it. I put in the chat the link to the Kodim. Um, so I, I guess everyone can read it. I don't know if, yeah, I'm just adding it right now. So do we have a JavaScribe? I don't know that we need one. Um, I'll be okay. doing minutes. Okay, right. So I consider we have the JavaScribe, uh, the minute ticker. It's fine. Um, so please sign the blue sheet. So I see that Ben is at, online. So we'll go through the, the documents that have been in AD review. So um, there are up to what I know four drafts, the DTLS authorized, the OAuth, authorization, the OAuth params, and the OS code profile. Um, I'm wondering if uh, Ben or anyone has any anything to say about those drafts? Yeah, yeah. It was uh, still, so I had to finish my food. Uh, that the framework and the params are done and they're just sort of in a holding pattern uh, waiting for the other two documents to be ready and then I'll send all four of them together to the IESG to review um, so that that way they can you know, look at the framework and in an instance or um, example of using the framework at the same time to uh, help understand both of them. The OS core profile is almost done, very nearly done. Um, yeah, I, yeah think... I can say, I can say something. The, yeah, we just please. submit the new version for the Oscar profile, and um, this should address all comments except for the text uh, about. Um, so it includes the, what we talked about last interim with the update of access rights text, and it's only missing the text about uh, uh, size of nonces. Yes. The only one thing missing right now. That's, that matches my notes. Um, I also had left myself a note uh, because we did change the procedure for the update of access rights. I need to have a little bit of a think about whether I should run another IETF last call uh, because that is different now. I, I don't know if it's different. I just think that that wasn't really, um, really um, explicitly mentioned before. Right, and I, I have not definitively decided that I will. I, I think I will think about it a little bit yeah. more. You haven't run one yet. I haven't? No, you're still waiting for on, the, still sitting on you. For the profiles, there is, has been no last call. I don't think there's been a last call on, on the uh, other document. On the either. on the frame on the framework and on the uh, the other one, yes, the params, yeah, there has been the a framework last call. and the params. There definitely has been. Uh, I will I will double check on the other one. The DTLS point. profile and OSCORE profile have not had the last call. Yes, they are still in AD evaluation. Sorry, I guess my my notes were bad. Uh, so yes. We will not need to do a second last call. We will need to do a first last call. Thank you. Uh, and then the DTLS profile, there's a new that I have not looked at yet, 
but it is believed to address all of my review comments. And so then I guess we could do the ITF last call for the two profiles together. Okay. And, Sounds and good. For, yep. for the ACE framework, uh, I see that Ludwig is online. Hi, Ludwig. So I, I did take a look at the email that was posted about the, the thread that Ben started about this uh, default value for authorization info. But yes. yeah, I, I'm not sure I understand what that is about. So if you could. I don't either. Okay. And I have not the time to read up so that I can understand what that really implies. The only thing I noticed, and, and Jim confirmed that, is that OAuth has not registered any well-known uh, uh, identifiers for, for their token endpoints and for the authorization endpoints and so on. And that gives me the feeling we shouldn't either. I mean, we are trying to actually mirror OAuth as close as possible and reasonable. And in this case, I don't see why we should do something that OAuth doesn't. Right. I, I guess my recollection is that OAuth has like a discovery document that gives you the URLs for all of the different endpoints that you can use. Uh, and so you only need to find the discovery document and then you have everything you need. Yep. Whereas I don't remember us in ACE having a, a discovery document. No. So we have this text about how um, the various, you know, the AS and the RS and whatnot can provide or endpoint URL they want, but we say we have a default value of it. And the, the issue sort of comes in if people take the default value as being what basically everybody uses and almost uh, an inherent part of the protocol. If we, if we give a default value, but we don't have a discovery mechanism, then the only way to use something other than the default value is if you have really configured it on both sides. And that may not happen very often. So um, if we are in effect saying that there's basically a part of the protocol that puts a URI path in the same namespace as the rest of the web server or the co-op server or what have you. That's sort of us as a protocol designer trying to tell the server how to name their things. And it really should be the server's idea of how to name their resources. And so that's sort of where the, the BCP 190 considerations come in that the names and the paths on the server should belong to the server and not to the protocol designers. Carsten? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in, in Coop, we have a discovery uh, mechanism and we could simply do what's needed to uh, make uh, ACE visible to that discovery mechanism. You mean the yes. resource directory, Carsten? Yeah. Well, the resource directory is the the way to distribute this information but we have yeah. a slash dot well known dot core a slash core and uh th that's the place where a node could uh, say something about the the structure of resources uh, it provides including the auth info resource then i i remember we had that discussion or we had a very brief discussion about it carson and that was really helpful for me because I haven't gotten the competence, haven't got the competence and the time to look into how it's done in, in core right now. I haven't got the competence and I don't have the time to get it. <laughs> so I have a follow up question. In the ACE key group com, we uh, registered the interface description link target attribute ACE group to indicate that the um, 
the KD or one node or the resource server, whatever, it implements this bunch of resources. And I saw, Karsten, that you suggested um, that the ACE framework, um, uh, that the ACE framework register a resource type link target attribute values instead of interface description. So is that like comparable and uh, how is that? Yeah, how is that different? Yeah, that's a great question. So in, in 2012, when we did this, um, we didn't have a very clear idea of uh, uh, what this was going to be. And uh, the, the interface link target attribute really just says, um, this is the, the kind of behavior you can uh, expect uh, for this resource. And the, the resource target says, this is the, the overall uh, behavior and purpose of this uh, resource. So th there is not a very strong um, distinction between those two, but it's a little bit like multiple inheritance in a programming language. So you, you, you can have multiple interfaces, uh, but you really should in the end uh, come out with a single uh, resource type. Okay, then I'm, I'm not sure that uh, we are doing the right thing, maybe. <laughs> I don't know if we should register interface or resource type. At, uh, from what you say, resource type sounds like the right choice for the ACE framework. Probably. Yeah, and then I'm not sure about the ACE Giggle.com. Yeah, unless you, you expect uh, some, some other SDO to go ahead and say, uh, we have the uh, OMA thingy, and this actually is a ASCII Groupcom thing, um, then you probably should go for RT. OK, thank you. So the question I would have is, um, should we have a discovery Protocol document, or is that something that is currently missing in uh, in this working group? Or my question would rather be: Can we please have a document separate from the framework so that we don't yeah, have yeah. to delay? The framework? Oh yeah, 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 sure. No. <laughs> if it's if it's only about registering the resource type. Why we could add it to the framework in the IANA section? No, I cannot. I don't have physically don't have the time to do anything but click a button here and there. Sometimes it's okay. that's my issue. I, I cannot invest Maybe more time. Maybe some of your co-authors could. <laughs> or the yeah. chairs give you a new co-editor. Because I mean, like the document will require attention at some point, right? <laughs> like even if it's just for the, the ISG review, etc. Yeah, but this is like a whole new, uh, yeah, whole new. We, have... we redo the ITF last call if we do this. That's not a, really? entirely crazy. I think we the sort of thing that we would be doing here is something that we could equally well be adding as a result of ISG review comments. And we typically do not do another ITF last call uh, for the changes that result from ISG review. OK. But Ben, do you, because I have the impression that the discovery um, is likely to to open a new discussion. So um, I'm wondering if if anyone has an opinion whether um, it should not be something um, separate or. So I, I have oh, a I is that something that the framework would? Define or is this really something that the profiles would define? 
Mm. So it will look very different for, for MQTT than, than for other things. Well, the fact that it depends on the protocol you use, for example, co-op has a discovery mechanism that we like to use if we use co-op, but we won't use it uh, for, for MQTT because it uses TCP. Uh, makes me believe <laughs> that uh, we might want to uh, actually push that to the profiles. Or, or makes me hope that I can push that to the profiles. <laughs> uh, I mean, so I guess what what I had in mind, and maybe this is totally wrong, uh, Karsten should pay attention and correct me, uh, but if we were just to basically uh, define the new co-op resource type for, um, well, I guess that's a, that's a question. Would it be for the resource that is a discovery document for all of the ACE things, or would it just be for, this is the, um, the AS endpoint and uh, we have the, the resource servers define, uh, have a resource type for their off -sea info points. I guess maybe it's not quite as simple as I first thought. We should have a, a bit more of a think about it. Yeah, I think we need a resource type per, per kind of endpoint. Maybe one or two of them actually are interfaces. Let, let's think about that uh, some more. Uh, but the, the different kinds of, of endpoints uh, should be uh, findable. And I'm, I'm really not talking about endpoints because that means something different. Uh, I'm talking about entry points. So the, the places that you need to to go to if you start talking with a uh, device or a server for the uh, first time. We, we need the resource types for those. Uh, and uh, I agree with Ludwig that really we want to do those in the profiles, even though the, the results will look very similar for uh, DTLS and OSCOR. By the way, this is like, we, we define the auth info and all the other endpoints in the framework. There are no other endpoints in the framework. The rest is, is OAuth already exists in OAuth. So you can use the OAuth discovery or how do you find the things? Things you cannot find uh, using OAuth mechanisms, we need to define a resource type for. For the right. others, and that would be our, the auth info endpoint. All the other endpoints are just the same as in OAuth. Unless I'm really, really mistaken now, but I don't think so. <clears throat> the entry point to the AS is given to you by the resource server when you attempt to access something and get a, an access denied. It is currently not telling you where to post your token. So that's the only one that needs to be done and that can, probably would be per, per profile basis. But the auth info default name uh, as well as the def default name of a uh, token at the AS. These are defined in the framework. Right, but it, but the RS tells you where to go talk. So we don't need a default name. So you don't need a default name. Okay, sure. If, okay, let's assume that we remove that one. But the, uh, the one at the resource server, the auth info, that's still defined, like the, it appears in the framework. And then the profiles use that. That's why I'm thinking. Yes, but you but you can define that in the profiles, so you guys can sit down and agree on a common way of doing it and be happy. I think Jim's proposal is to say that the framework just talks about the off -sea info endpoint and does not say anything about default path or anything like that. Does not refer to slash off -sea info. 
every every place you might talk about it, it will just say the off -C info endpoint, and then it's up to the profiles to give uh, an interpretation to that. So each file would then do what? Register its own? That doesn't sound... I mean, I, I understand one would register, but then the other profile would use that, or... That would be fine. So what would, would the of the info endpoints for OSCore and DTLS be different or the same? It's the same, at, at least right now, I think. Well, that I'll use for doing it in the framework, then. Huh? Yeah, that's my point. <laughs> but it's, it's specific to the use of co-op. Yes. And uh, there has been very okay. loud voices the, the, that framework. the framework should not be specific to co-op. The it's framework right now recommends co-op, right? Yeah. But we've had very loud voices claiming we yeah, shouldn't. If, if you're not doing co-op, then you can use the OAuth. So what you could say is that uh, the framework defines this resource type for the use by profiles that actually use co-op. Hmm. Yeah, like to me, this would be a small, like it wouldn't even require much text in, in the oh. document. It's just IANA registration, that's it. That's what I understood. Okay. I have no idea where to start, even. What do I register there? I can send you text. Really helpful. Justin, are you one of the co-authors? By the way. Of oh, the no, you no, you're no. not, nope. sorry. Mixed up with probably the actor's document. Well, yes, and in particular the DTLS framework, yeah. Okay. Like, as long as this doesn't require another last call, because, yeah. Well, I think uh, I agree with Ben that uh, this would be one of the usual things to come out in an ISG uh, review, and we do these all the time. And uh, it's it's not a technical change in the sense that the protocol changes. It's just a name that has been reserved for use by the profiles. And of course, the profiles have to go ahead and actually use that thing. But if it's a reasonable suggestion and it's done the way you should do these things in co-op, then I don't see that as a problem. We have a small bike shed thing. What should be the name of that resource type? Marco, have all the stuff you register started with Oscor or with Ace? Ace dot. I think Ace dot in this context. Uh, I can double check. Maybe Marco and I can uh, uh, bike shed that name offline and send a proposal to the list. I have no strong opinion on the, how we call it. Uh, it's not here anyway. We're doing that here. For resource types. You say that again? Uh, Ace dot something. Oh, good, good, okay. Uh, here for resource types, yeah. So it sounds like Karsten is going to draft some text for the framework and send it to Ludwig. And then once we have that, we will have a better picture on what the profile documents need to take into the, uh, as their changes. Right. OK. Um, I don't I don't Thank you very much for the offer to help Karsten. It's very much appreciated. 
Yes, thank you. Um, I don't remember that there were any other open items for the four documents that are currently uh, out of the working group. So does that bring us to uh, Marco's documents, Cheers? Yeah. So just a comment. When we are trying to find the name of the resource, I don't want to have everyone waking, waking up for that. <laughs> So, if it's, if if you're if if you're not completely against, please abstain. <laughs> so, Marco, you're yes. next. Yes, this one. Thank you. So, an update on this draft that was just quickly announced in two minutes in November uh, at the Singapore meeting and describing an admin interface at the Oscar Group Manager. Right, so we have another document in ACE, in fact, describing an interface of the group manager for um, candidate group members. That through that interface can join the group, get the key material to operate in the group, and later on continue interacting with, with the group manager. Uh, so what is missing yet is a different interface um, at the group manager again, uh, but intended for an administrator to create, set up, and delete those all score groups. Next slide, please. Right, and this is what we define in this document. Uh, in fact, it's a different RESTful interface uh, for the administrator. That is the first thing to be done before uh, the group is properly set up and can be joined by um, candidate members. And interestingly, the, the interface and the way groups are represented here uh, is very similar to um, the pattern used, for instance, uh, by the intended co-op hub subbroker. Uh, practically, we have um, a single instance of a group collection resource at uh, the group manager, say, uh, the example path slash manage. Uh, and then we have under that resource uh, one group configuration resource uh, per OSCOR group uh, created at that group manager that you essentially identify over the same path, um, appending, for instance, the group name. And well, of course, we use ACE uh, for the sake of access control for uh, the administrator that here becomes the client, while the group manager is again uh, the resource server. And we just use transparently transfer profile of ACE for the secure communication between administrator and group manager. Next slide, please. Right. Uh, well, what we showed uh, in November last year was version zero. And after that, we got um, a review from Jim. Thanks a lot for that. That we mostly addressed, in fact, um, in this revision zero one. Uh, we especially organized better the parameters describing the current group configuration, and we enrich the interface with more functionalities, describe what can happen as side effects to the group members in case the administrator changes something delicate, like uh, the algorithms used in the group or their parameters. Uh, other than revising the examples we had already, we also added examples uh, in Coral. And Klaus also joined the author list. Next slide, please. Right, to give a more uh, operative overview, uh, some operations are available at that single uh, group collection resource. So the idea is to send uh, a post request to that resource in order to create uh, a new Oscar group and possibly providing at that time already um, some values for the configuration parameters. Uh, instead of sending a get or a fetch request, if uh, it's interesting to specify some filter criteria, it's possible to retrieve some of the configurations, all or, or some of the configurations of the currently uh, registered groups. Uh, next slide, please. Um, well, instead sending uh, a request to a particular group configuration, well, uh, with the get, you just retrieve the content of that configuration and the full list of parameter with values. Uh, a put is uh, for a time being intended for uh, fully update the current configuration, just uh, overwriting the current one. And with delete, you can uh, destroy that resource and, and dismantle the, the OSCOR group. Uh, next, please. Yes, uh, as I said, we split also the parameters describing uh, how the group is configured now. Uh, the first set is the configuration properties, uh, essentially describing how the group works 
from a cryptographic point of view. And then we have the status properties with well, uh, anything else. Uh, if the group is currently active and communication can actually happen in that, uh, the name for the sake of announcement and discovery, uh, a title is uh, intended to be more descriptive of what the group is about. Then later on, we also have the joining path, which is actually a URI uh, pointing at the side resource at the group manager where uh, joining nodes should send their join request instead, as described in the other is document. And we also have the URI to the authorization server where those uh, joining nodes should um, check to get an access token first before joining the group. Next slide, please. Right, just some selected examples from the draft. Uh, there are more there. Uh, a get to the collection resource uh, returns to you essentially the, the list of all the uh, configuration resources currently present as corresponding to the uh, registered OSCOR groups. So practically the links or the entries uh, to, to later on send a request to those groups. Next, please. Yeah, a post to the collection resource uh, for creating the group. You can see here some values uh, are specified for some of the parameters. Uh, for other parameters, uh, default values apply. Uh, at the group manager. And when a new group is created, the group manager actually creates two resources. The one is the group configuration resource that I've talked about, and that's again intended for the administrator. And in parallel, a corresponding group membership resource is created, and that's the one intended for the joining nodes and in the join request. And next, please. Yes. Uh, final example, I think uh, a get sent to a configuration resource just returns the full uh, current configuration of that score group with um, all its parameters. Next, please. Yeah, we have also a section describing what happens uh, in the group, uh, especially to recurring group members. If the administrator changes something delicate, like if it switches off the group as um, inactive, or if it changes current uh, algorithms and parameters, and especially if the signature algorithm or, or its parameters are changed, uh, current group members may not support that anymore. In that case, they just have to leave the group essentially. Or they might just end up with a, a public key that is not compatible uh, with the new algorithm or parameters anymore. So in that case, they can either leave and join again, providing a new compatible public key, or just stay in the group and upload a new compatible public key with the interface we have for them uh, at the group manager described in the other document. And uh, considering comments from Jim, we are working to simplify the section because it, it was in its current version too, too difficult to read. Next slide, please. And we are done. Uh, yes, we are defining a RESTful interface for an administrator of OSCOR groups at the group manager to create, configure, and delete uh, OSCOR groups. So it goes handy end with the other interface intended for joining nodes. And uh, we have examples both in the format or CBOR uh, and Coral. Uh, as immediate next step, we plan to submit a revision before the cutoff, uh, mostly addressing uh, another review we got from Jim on version one. More comments are welcome anyway. Thank you. So, um... I'm wondering what kind of issues uh, this document is raising. Well, there's current no interface or mechanism available to practically set up uh, the groups. We are magically assuming they are there already. And this is a way to create and configure them. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. I mean, um, um, in your document, what are the things that uh, you think uh, um, might need some uh, specific discussions? Uh, I think Jim is proposing in side comments reviews of Coral uh, to further improve the interface here to provide even more information in, in responses, like giving indications of, of how Coral forms can work uh, for requests from the administrator following the very first one. It's not really an issue, but uh, yeah. there's still room for design choices ahead. Mm, okay. Mostly for Coral. Okay. And I I don't know, Jim, 
um, I suppose that you're willing to those documents to be adopted. I I don't know what is Jim's opinion on that. Should we wait a little bit, or should we start a call for adoption soon? Would not object to having an adoption call on this document sooner rather than later. Anyone has a strong opinion against having a, a call for adoption? I don't have an opinion. I have a question. Um, so um, the group manager in in some documents may, might be an application that. Uh, knows from its application stage uh, which groups to create and, and delete and so on. So it might not actually provide this at an interface. Is, is that what you have in mind as well? We didn't think of that, but sure, if it knows everything already and does everything of its own, yeah, then there's no need to export an interface to another entity. So this, this is really for, for group managers that are kind of decoupled a bit from the, the actual application that it decide, that decides it needs groups. And then you can have a network element somewhere that, that provides this functionality with the northbound interface, which is the admin one, and the southbound uh, interface is the group management interface. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. I think that, that, that would be uh, important information for people making use of the specification that they they don't think they have to have this interface for every group manager, even when uh, there is another way uh, for the group manager to already know what, what it needs to do. Right. Thank you. Um, just for clarification, do you mean when the application is a single group? Um, if there is an application running somewhere that, that is creating groups and, and removing groups and from the application state, it, it's clear what those groups need to be. You don't need this admin interface because it's the application state that controls setting mm, up okay. the, the collections. And I think similar to the resource directory, which, which can be described as a relatively independent network element or can be defined as something that, that provides an application that provides a resource directory uh, interface in addition to its other application interfaces. Uh, we have a similar situation here. Okay, yeah. Okay. So it's really for an administrator external uh, from the group manager itself. Yes, or it might be a, a useful interface within your application server. So that, 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 that's okay. Um, but I, all I'm trying to say is if you already have another way to, to get this information, uh, you don't have to provide this admin interface with the group manager. Mm, okay. Any other comment or should we move to the next presentation? Right. Um... This was also very quickly advertised uh, November last year in Singapore. Uh, Why we're having this document, um, access tokens, other than becoming expired at some point, they can also be um, revoked earlier than that for a number of reasons, like interested parties are compromised or there's a change in related access policies or is profile to use. And OAuth partially covers this, uh, admitting revocation for clients, but not for a resource owner or the resource server. And it's not all in all perceived as a big problem because uh, tokens are supposed to have a short lifetime. Uh, so in ACE, it is different. Tokens last much longer. And uh, we would like to have a way for the authorization server uh, at the end of the day to inform interested parties about um, tokens that are expired, uh, but uh, sorry, revoked but not expired yet. So next, please. And here we are, in fact, defining uh, an interface and a resource at the authorization server, uh, having a, a single instance resource uh, after draft revision. 
uh, of a token revocation list uh, or TRL, um, essentially containing uh, the names or hashes of tokens that um, have been revoked, though not expired yet. And that said, uh, a client or a resource server can just send a get or even observe uh, that TRL resource to get uh, back the list of pertaining access tokens or automatic notification about that uh, for pertaining access tokens that um, have been revoked. And there are a number of benefits. Well, we can serve both clients and resource servers. We are complementing the introspection mechanism and there is no need on clients or resource servers for more resources or endpoint. And this version one already was the result of a review on the list from Travis Spencer and a lot of side discussion with James. Thank you both. Next slide. Thank you. Uh, so what's the rationale? Uh, we give names or identifiers to tokens, but not in the sense of, of CTIs. We actually name tokens with hashes as described in 6920. And we are actually able to support uh, the case where the token is transported uh, either on Cbor or on JSON. So this token revocation list on the AS is essentially um, a Cbor array of the token ashes of tokens that that AS uh, issued uh, are not yet expired, but uh, have been revoked. So if a token is revoked, uh, its token ash is added to the list. Uh, later on, when it eventually expires, the token ash is removed. And interactions are pretty simple. Uh, so the client and the resource server uh, somehow registers at the AES through a mechanism that it, as far as I know, out of scope even for AES itself. Uh, but in the response from the AES following the registration, um, they get back the exact URI of the TRL resource at the authorization server. And later on, they can send their request or observation request uh, to remain up to date. Uh, they would get back only what exactly pertained to them. So not the full list, uh, only the revoked tokens that have been issued to that client only or intended to be consumed to that resource server only. But we are also admitting the case of a particular uh, requester like a system administrator that in instead um, uh, can retrieve just the full list because the, the whole of it is pertinent to it. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, just to give uh, an intuitive overview uh, in ASCII art, uh, here we have the administrator, two clients, two resource servers. Uh, we have one client with uh, two access tokens, T1 and T2, uh, to be consumed by only RS1 or only RS2, respectively. And then client who has only a token T3 to be consumed by RS2. So let's say all of them are registered at the AS, uh, all of them uh, observe the TRL resource. And at some point, all of those three tokens uh, get revoked. Uh, their token hash uh, is included in the TRL resource and the authorization server sends the five different uh, notifications indicating only the pertaining token hashes to each of the five requesters. Next slide, please. Right. And we start in thinking of this with a, a single mode of operation that we uh, call full query. Uh, where essentially the requester sends a GET request or GET observe, and the result coming back is the, the whole pertaining portion of the uh, TRL resource. Uh, Jim suggested also to consider um, a diff query mode where uh, the requester is interested not in getting uh, the full current content of the pertaining part of the TRL resource, but only what happened in the latest specified uh, and updates. So in this case, the response would be a collection of diff entries, one for each of the latest and updates. And each diff entry in turn would specify uh, the token hashes that for that request that were added or deleted at that update. And uh, we got a recent review from Karsten and we are working to simplify both the interface and the uh, uh, representation of the response payload uh, in diff mode. Thanks for that. I conclude with the example we have in the draft, just to fix ideas. Uh, it's pretty basic. Uh, we have only one resource server here, considering um, the full mode and observing the TRL resource. So it registers first, gets back the URI to the TRL resource, starts observing it, uh, of course, gets immediately back an empty uh, Cibra array. 
Then later on, the AES uh, issues to access tokens um, to some of the clients uh, around, but to be consumed by the same RS. So next slide, please. Um, ben, do you want to make a comment or a question now, or? I think I can wait to the end. Okay. Can you move to the next slide? Thanks. Uh, yeah, at some point, access token T1 is revoked. So the access to the authorization server sends back a notification indicating that to the resource server. Then later on, T2 is also revoked. And the second notification is sent indicating both access tokens. Uh, even later on, uh, T1 eventually expires. So a third notification is sent now indicating only T2 as part of the pertaining portion of uh, TRL uh, for the resource server. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, to summarize, this is an interface with AS, uh, supporting GET or GET observe uh, into uh, grain mode uh, to notify both client and resource servers about tokens, um, issues for them or related to them uh, that are now revoked, though not expired yet. And there's no need for new resources or endpoints at client service or servers. And this revision um, is the result of uh, process comments from the review from Travis and side discussion with Jim. And we plan to have a, a revision uh, before the next cutoff, uh, also addressing a review we have recently got from Karsten. Thanks. That's it. OK, I, I will jump in. I had, I think, two points. The uh, first one was with the sort of diff update that from Jim's review. Uh, um, first, this does seem pretty useful, um, but I'm not entirely sure if the sort of give me the last n changes is the most effective way to do that. Uh, it actually reminded me a lot about the JMAP protocol, um, which it was originally JSON mail access protocol, but they changed it to be a more generic name, and I forget what it now stands for. Um, but there's a, a working group they put out documents already, and what sort of the general concept is to give a, a name to the state on the server for a given resource, and like this name is probably going to be some output or similar, and so then the server you the state of the, the the full TRL or it also sends back hash value that sort of identifies that state in time uh, of the resource. And then when you go and ask for, as you can say, this is the name of the last thing that you gave me. Please give me changes since then. Um, and they even have a little bit more of a complicated setup where if you know, the number of, the total number of changes is too many, you can get some intermediate state back, and I noticed that there there may still be more if you ask right away. I don't know if we would need all of that complication. Um, but the idea that you can have an explicit name and say, give me changes from the last state I had will let you be sure that you're getting all the changes or that you know that you missed some. So like if your, if your state name is too old and the server has uh, dropped some of that since then, we will explicitly tell you, sorry, I can't do that because I lost some state. You need to fetch the whole list and start over again. Um, so this sort of uh, named state might be worth looking into. Um, and then my second point was that if we're going to use a hash of the token to identify the token in the TRL, um, everybody needs to know which hash we're using. And I took a quick look through the document and it says, you know, you pick a secure hash and whatnot, but I didn't see a way for a sort of in-band um, indicator of which hash used. Um, I think that everybody would need to agree on that in order to be actually interpreting the values the same way. Correct. And on the second point, uh, well, what sounds obvious to me is having that specified in the registration response from the AES at registration time. That seems likely to work. Uh, should actually write it in the document, I think. Yes. 
<laughs> on the first point, it sounded to me like even a third mode of operation, actually. Um, if I understand correctly, it's more oriented to, to snapshots. Like, I'm, I'm interested in the, I don't know, second from last version and last version you, you had about me. Um, I guess you, you could do something like that. I, it's not clear to me that that was the primary reason that JMAP did it that way. Uh, but I also was not deeply involved in the JMAP work. I just reviewed it as the ISG. So yeah. I think Kasten, um, yeah, this, this, this kind of situation where you have a, a series of uh, things, uh, that, that gets added to th that's exactly what's discussed in this, uh, serious transfer pattern, uh, draft that I sent the name of, uh, to the chat. And uh, I think it might be worth looking at that. Uh, draft and and seeing do do we have a conventional way of handling this kind of situation already and if yes we might want to use it if no we might want to add this particular case to the serious transfer pattern uh, draft so so we know how to handle similar situations in the future We have been looking into that. That there seems to be a mapping, in fact, between the way we have diff query mode now and that draft. Okay. Thanks for that pointer too. So Ben, do you think it is worthwhile we we think better also in terms of yeah full latest versions in the recent past? I think for for the specific TRL use case, I can't think of a reason you would want a specific version that is not the latest version. Um, okay, for that, the full query mode r returns just the current representation. So yeah. I think and the, the reason why James suggested what evolved into the diff query mode was to just catch up with some missing notifications that, that were lost as non-confirmable. And that was a way to, to get just missing chunks and, and build a full story again for the requester. Right. I think that's exactly what I had in mind for the use okay. case. <laughs> Any other comment? Gaston reconnected or? Uh, he's reconnecting, he says. Yeah. So, well, we're going to ask Gaston if he has any comment and then we, we may be briefly go through um, MQ, MQTT. Hello. I'm here. I haven't, you know, I haven't prepared slides because there's not much to say, except that uh, a version five been submitted um, that answered the topics that were raised um, in the previous interims, and Jim um, sent a review which we can test majority of the comments. Um, there are not major technical issues outstanding. There are um, uh, editorial ones and new definitions I have. Um, there are a few outstanding things to discuss regarding um, converging uh, what session state uh, the authorization, uh, the uh, resource server, the broker keeps, as well as format. Is that kind of an outstanding to discuss? We have mentioned AIF as the standard scope for the um, for all the profiles. Uh, regarding uh, the AIF, uh, I've also looked at. What we've defined 
Um, however, I, I don't have a full resolution because the scope that we um, tested in the MQTT profile serves two um, purposes. One, to permit the permission verbs to publish and subscribe, and the other is uh, enable those verbs to be used over a topic filter, which is the standard way in MQTT to communicate what resources you are interested in, in a um, kind of summarized um, Having the permission for topic filters was quite handy um, and that we've, uh, we've used that. So I'm not too sure how these two things can be brought together at the moment and whether that is stopping the MQTT profile progressing further. Um, yeah. So um, do you, I mean, um, I guess you're, you, you're sort of blocked now. Um, yeah, that question, and, yes. The question, yes, because in the scope. Basically, a simple commendation file does not also re uh, require a certain scope to be used. It's just a recommendation that it makes. Um, and we put that recommendation because we got feedback before that it would be useful to recommend a scope. Uh, format, uh, a style uh, in the profiles. I have some discussion about scope uh, as well in my um, presentation here for the ASCII group com. Because we also got the, like, we wanted to include this AIF scope document as a recommendation, and that doesn't really work. So we want to discuss that. Okay. I think the major but, thing that I wasn't too clear on is I can understand that the new keywords can, of course, be added, the publish, subscribe. But the idea was to be able to use those, those permissions over a subset of topics, which are really nicely described with the topic filters using um, wildcards in MQTT. And I wasn't too sure how that is now represented in AIF when you want that permission to apply to multiple resources. I'm not positive that I think that using AIF makes sense anymore, um, unless we also have a text version of the AIF stuff, because the scope has to be a UTF-8 string if we're doing JSON off. Well, that's what you have base 64 for. Right, but then I have to figure out the difference between a base 64 string and death string, which can be kind of fun. Well, what I understand is that for MQTT, it ends up introducing a new way uh, MQTT used to work. So um, for that reason, I think it was being asked whether we should go continue with um, this new format, even um, if it, looks, it looked uh, promising uh, in the beginning. Can we take the scope discussion on, on my slides so that, because I we said that we would want the MQTT uh, format of scope to work um, also in the ASCII group com, so we need to adapt to that as well. Yeah. Um, so so that that was oh, please go. When you propose scope, basically, it puts resources as a top, basically. So I can understand why the scope is not. Sorry, am I dropping? Uh, 
bit. For me, a little bit, yes. Yeah, for me too. Okay. Right. The question was we last time. So the scope we defined in the MQTT profile is enough to be adopted by others. Um, I had to admit that when I when I proposed it, I was really thinking MQTT specific in terms of topic field, etc. So I, I didn't hear you. I was saying that the scope discussion can be on Francesca's slides. Okay. That's fine. Um, um, the state information that is kept for continuing sessions at the RS. Um, and um, Jim was suggesting that the token used should be part of the state and i was questioning whether that means the client can only continue a session with a previous token because if it got a new token between the two then it would want to use the new token to reconnect so there is a discussion ongoing in github about this so that's the only um slightly technical remainder <laughs> basically uh, for the MQTT profile. Mm. I hope you've heard me now. Yeah. So the rest and, um, of the suggestions, definitions, and typos have been fixed. It's just these two that I need to get a um, off to move further. Okay. Um, and do you need help to solve this issue or? Are you about to to solve it? I think I, I've I've opened a uh, issue in GitHub um, with uh, Jim's comment and commented back. So, if I've understood him correctly, and he uh, if we can converge there, it's fine. It's just that uh, it is the question of what the uh, what we allow the client to do. Do we um, we now? the clients can continue sessions in MQTT. And when the client reconnects, it has to still provide a token. If the token is part of the state, then we expect that to be equal to the old token. However, if the client got a new token between the you know, between these two events, then we have an issue. I suggested the client token may be part of the state rather than must be part of the state. Um, and in that case, we are not really authorizing the continuation of the session we are authorizing the just client coming back and i thought that was acceptable because mqtt anyway recognizes clients only by client id and you know finds client state by just using client id as a key and that's why i thought it was acceptable the way that way and it's still secure because the client needs to provide a token and that token is still verified doesn't authorize that it's the same client that's continuing and there might be a mix up. However, it doesn't create any remaining um, message that is delivered to the client, it's recovered by its token anyway. I'm not too sure if you understand here the difference between a may and a must of what the session state keeps. Um. I have to to spend more time on that, but um, I don't see major um, interrupt interoperability problems. But I have to go through that. Um, I'm wondering what Jim think. I need to sit down and try to build my attack case better. Okay. So I will the other have a look. Solution would be, uh, yeah. The other solution that I propose, which I will add to GitHub, is that 
if we want to really do better client identification than original MQTT, then we would have uh, we can say continuing clients can only uh, connect with their old token, where even that they expired, and then we do a uh, key checking there, and then immediately they have to submit a new token by using um, uh, re token. So they connect the token and uh, because they know that that's expired. That's another way of going about it. But that means the continuing clients can only use the challenge-based mechanism to authenticate to the RS. Anyway, so that will be in the issue in the GitHub. So that's one issue remaining, and the other issue is the scope issue. Okay. So we'll go through the scope issue um, through Francesca. Um, any additional comment? Michael Richardson, can you be shy and turn off your camera? Thank you. I thought it was uh, turned off. So confusing. So I just have a quick question, probably because I haven't followed this, but it, it sounds to me uh, this is somewhat related to the update of access rights discussion we had last meeting where um, because for for the for the ace key group com stuff um, we are saying that we are saying that when you post uh, old token that should not uh, sorry, for the Oscor profile stuff, that when you post the old token, it should not um, um, have a full consequence to derive a new security association. Here, Is that... Yeah, here the token would be used to just um, show to the RS that I am the client that's coming back. Mm -hmm. But what I was saying that um, originally, if you look at MQTT specification, when they do continuing sessions, they basically only mechanism to identify this client that's coming back is the client ID. They use the client ID as the parameter to key to look up the client state. Um, and they don't, uh, and I, that's why I, what I was falling back on just to check which client is continuing. Um, however, there might be an issue in this case where client A with an ID joins with session continuation, drops, then a client B comes with the same client ID, and then the state is kept for the client, and the RS thinks it's the same client, but it's not. It's just the same client ID, two different clients. In that case, since the token is and, and validated and verified, client will never get any messages that they were not supposed to get, and they will not be able to publish to anything that they were not supposed to get anyway. So um, that's why the uh, profile at the moment should token uh, as a R you know RS state as a may. You know, if you want, you can confirm further whether this is the client that's really continuing. Um, but that's where the old token is used at the moment. It's not just um, old rights, but it's just saying to the RS, hey, I'm the one who's coming back and you stay for me. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Yeah, it's clear now. Don't have a solution, but now I understand the problem. <laughs> okay, shall we go to the key provisioning now? Yeah, sure. Let's talk about it. So next slide. Uh, this is the quick recap. Next slide. Um, okay, so this is a long slide and I'm not going to go through, but it's just to um, um, summarize the, what happened since last interim. Basically, we 
submitted a new version that was based on Daniel's review and some leftover points that were discussed during the last interim. And then in each bullet point here, you can find um, you can find the uh, the commits that answer each point. So this is all of them. And also we answer Peter's review, which was from version 03. So this is um, quite an old review and it's uh, it took us some time to get to it, but we finally implemented it. And there is a couple of points that we want to follow up, discuss today. The first point is the normalized scope. So uh, during last interim, we, um, we decided to add this informative reference to AIF for scope. And while we were doing that, we realized, okay, this might not be the best, uh, like, um, this might not be adapted to this document. And then uh, Peter review, we implemented almost everything, but there is some point that we don't agree with and we want the working group guidance. Next slide. So from Daniel's review, the major point that I want to bring up is that we have now uh, registered register the new ACE parameters to the OAuth parameters registry and OAuth parameters seaboard mapping registry instead of the AS request creation hints registry. And this is um, this is um, consistent with what we do in the OSCOR profile where we, do, we register nonce one and nonce two. And so these parameters are parameters that are um, uh, carrying information about the signing uh, like signing parameters, public public key encoding and KDC challenge. So that this is nothing major, but it need to be done. So next, yeah, normalized scope. So this is the the point where we should have a more interesting discussion. Um, so right now the scope for the document, just as a reminder. Um, we have what we call a group identifier and the role. These are um, uh, defined by the application profile. For example, the ACE key group on OSCORE defines that this is, for example, byte string and text string. And then we have a scope entry, which is an array that contains a first element is the group ID or topic identifier or whatever uh, you want to identify your um, um, you need to identify your security group and then optionally the second element is one or more roles. This could be a uh, requester, responder, it could be publisher, subscriber, or it could be a um, combination of those. And then finally the scope is just a sequence um, or it's um, an array of several scope entries. So in this example, for a group post-core communication, we have a group identifier, let's say that it's H01, then a group resource, which is uh, slash topic 01, let's say, and then we have some roles, request responder, monitor, requester plus responder. Next slide. So requester means that the node is allowed to send group requests and accept group responses. And the responder is someone who accepts group requests and send group responses. Then, um, then we have requester and responder, which is does both, and monitor, which is ac accept group request but does, does not reply. And we were thinking the AIF um, um, so an example of AIF is uh, if you take, for example, the first um, on the right, H01 requester, this is a scope as we define it right now with the scope entry. And if we want to use AIF for the role, then um, we replace this requester with this uh, CBOR array, where the first element is the group resource URI path, in this case, topic dash zero one and then the second element is a bitmap with that indicates what what methods this node is allowed to do so since this is a requester we are assuming that it can do anything on this resource in this specific example so we say 63 and 
And we are thinking, okay, is this the equivalent to the scope that we have defined in our document? And we try to do this for the several um, for the several roles that we have. So let's say for the responder, we thought, okay, the responder is not allowed to request anything. So let's say that the bitmap is to zero. So no method is allowed on that resource. But there is really no way to, to say that um, um, something about the response, what, what the node is allowed to do for the response. Also, like we kind of invented them. Oh. Uh, can you hear me? Is it only Kasten or? I can I hear, hear you. you. I hear you fine. Okay, so okay, so it's Kasten that dropped. Um, okay, so for requester and responder, we kind of made the mix, and we say, okay, we can maybe merge these two. Um, uh, roles and then say that it, this is just a, um, a array that contains both of those. And we don't have any way to say monitor, to say, okay, you're allowed to, to accept requests, but you're not allowed to reply. We don't have any, like, I didn't find any way to express that because AEF only specifies policy for request methods. And in our case, roles also refer to responses or for the OSCOR, the ace key group com OSCOR document. Also another problem that the AEF uh, does not cover is that the AES does not necessarily know the group resource. So the AES is the first node that is gonna send the scope. Uh, so it's gonna send the scope in the, in the token and to the, to the client. And then the client is gonna forward that. So the S does not necessarily know the group resource, so it cannot include that in the scope. And th those were two two reasons why uh, we don't know how to include AIF as a recommended or yeah, because it, in this case it does not work. And if I understand what Sigdem was saying, she also was having problem with that, making AIF work for PubSub. I think that AIF does need some changes, which is part of what my review was. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it would be good to, to recommend something that, that could be used for, for several uh, documents, but it's not this one that maybe either like what what type of changes do you have any idea Jim or um well the first thing is I think that we need to be able to specify strings instead of just request methods which would deal with your responder requester issue okay so the second element instead of having a bitmap or yes okay mm -hmm. You could do both. Um, I don't think that have the first one being a wild card um, should be an issue as long as everybody understands what that is. So I don't think that, that the MQTT document should have a problem with that particular thing. I think you should still be able to specify plus slash foobar. Um, sorry, sorry, I don't know. Oh, this is MQTT stuff. It, yeah, but is this referring to the to the resource or? This is referring to the resource. Okay, yeah. So the resource should be able to be any string um, as long as it is acceptable, both the AS and the RS. Yeah. Um, I don't know if Sigdem is, is reconnected, if you can hear me right now. Uh, she's not connected. I can, no. I'm listening, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, so if you have any... Uh, my... That's good. I heard of what you said, I just, uh, just heard what Jim said. Okay, yes, indeed, the strings can be specified in a way that uh, all parties 
the wild card stand for. Mm -hmm. And then the question is, the AS does not necessarily know this resource. So then the OSCORE document, the AES in the OSCORE doc would not know what to put there. So are we saying that we, we can also skip that first element? But you would what Under what circumstances does the AS not know that element? It does not know the, the group resource. It only cares about the group identifier. Yeah. So it it does have to know the, the H, uh, the, the zero 01 here, but it doesn't have to know topic dash zero 01. So who, who, who translates the group ID, ID into a resource name later on? Um, so the resource server is telling the client, oh, you requested this. Um, you requested this, so you need to contact that AS. And I think it's okay. I need to check, but yeah, I'm, I'm asking this question because I just want to make sure that those translations actually are done in a secure way. So the authorization actually means something well defined. As long as we mm -hmm. can make sure what that is, we can essentially the the the. What AF does is it associates names of things with permissions on things. And what we find out is that names of things are not always URI paths. And we find out that permissions on things are not always method names or method numbers. So that, that's the kind of generalization we have to do to make AF more, more useful in, in a number of cases. Francesca, as far as I know, the group name is what you should be having. So slash topic dash zero one should be the group name. But that's not exactly what AIF. Right, and AIF yeah. needs to get fixed to deal with that. Mm. Yeah, that would work, definitely. Because the only one who can map names to group IDs is the, the the KDF? Yes. KD, 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 KDC. 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 <laughs> KDC. Um, yeah. Because it will change the group ID on a semi regular basis, mm -hmm. and that should not invalidate the token. Yeah. If you can have, but if you can have the group name instead of the. Um, resource there. I think that would work. And then of course the second part, the methods with something that um, also cover the response, which can be if it's a if it's a text string, then we can define it ourselves. But the group name, I'm just thinking right now, like right now the scope includes the group ID and and the role, role being requester. Um, so group ID should cover whatever group name. Yeah, it's called GID in ASCII.com, but for instance, in the group of score case, it really means what we call group name. So a static fixed name can be mapped with the URI of the joining resource. 
It's actually a name. So 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 then if that's like that, then instead of um, here instead of having this equivalence between the way we define it right now and and the one with AAF being an array inside the array, then it will become the same as we have right now so with H01 with the group name or group ID or whatever we want to call it. And the second element being the requester, the text string. If AIF is going to allow text string there. Yeah, only that the roles we have now are not intended to define what you can do with the group manager, but what you can do later on into the group. Well, I understand AF is about um, describing what you can do with the token consumer. So, okay, so the point is that it would be quite big changes to end up with the same format that we have defined right now. That's what I'm getting out of it. A lot of changes in AIEF. That's... Um, what I am very unclear is, um, are we repeating some things with using AIEF or? So the point is, let me summarize. AAF, as it's defined right now, does not cover the ASCII groupcom OSCORE case, which is why I had a problem uh, putting it in, in the document and say we recommend the use of AIF because for the one document that we have, it does not work. And Jim said that he has uh, suggested changes that would make it work. Um, and yeah, these changes seem quite, uh, quite big for the AAF document. So I don't know if Karsten has the time to look at those and what does he think about this, but. Yeah, I think it, this is really interesting. There are two aspects to AAF. One is. Uh, defining an overall structure for um, authorization information that, that is uh, relatively simple. And the other one is actually defining the elements of that structure. And I think what you said is that the, the elements you have don't fit. Uh, can, can you tell me whether the overall structure of AF is, is uh, useful for you or what would you need a different structure there as well. No, I think the overall structure is uh, is useful. Then it depends on what you consider the overall structure. Yeah, um, so so maybe it's actually worth uh, taking the AF document and essentially uh, divide it into two parts. One this ha which has this overall structure that essentially we, we are uh, using these arrays with uh, names for for things and and permissions, and and um, Jim has a proposal of what to do with the permissions as well, and the other one is uh, defining what those names mean and what those permissions mean. Yeah, that sounds good, and I think we need to make sure that this works, of course, for MQTT as well. Yes. While we do that, yeah. Okay. Next slide, so I will try to be super quick. Yeah, but just um, a comment uh, regarding MQTT, if we use uh, a AF, a AIF, um, I'm wondering if, because I, I have the impression that we're replacing the topic's names with maybe some uh, stars and uh, special characters by something that provides more information that is already known by the context of the session. So um, I'm wondering if we're not trying to make something harder, at least in the MQTT, um, in the scope of MQTT. Um, so is the advantage that we have one single format that works for all the different protocols or? 
you seen the number of ways that the AS has to parse the scope? It is a huge win. Okay. From, from implementation experience. Okay, I see. Yeah, so the, the, the other question from uh, Daniel, uh, whether having strings with wildcards in them and so on really is something we should be doing in, in a constrained environment, that's actually an interesting question. Uh, so maybe uh, we should look at the MQTT use case and, and see how exactly this should be done there. But I think that that's a bit orthogonal to the question, can we define a common structure and can we define uh, some some de uh, default or basic meanings for the element of that structure? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I see now. Um, it was just that coming from one perspective, I I wanted to, to, to get a wider picture of it, so. Um, may I clarify one uh, aspect of the AIF draft? The uh, We all discussed that it, at the moment it registers the methods as get and et cetera, but in the future, will it be possible or will it be defined in a way where the profile can um, insert its own method? I mean, I can see can now be defined to include publish and subscribe, but to be future proof, if there are other permission verbs that needs to be used in the scopes, could it be that the profiles are able to register those keywords? I think that that's the direction you want to go, yes. Okay. Okay, but I think we're out of time, but I just wanted to um, finish this. <laughs> so um, this is a, an issue from Peter uh, review, and it's about terminology. And Peter wanted us to define new terminology, something called a management channel, being the channel between client and KDC and group channel between client and other group members. And we authors don't think that this would help a lot in the document clarifying things and would rather prefer not to define this new terminology. Um, and also if, if there are sections where it is not clear which which channel we are talking, which, par which parties are, are talking, then we should rephrase those, but we don't really know. Uh, yeah, it, it sounds, <laughs> yeah, we don't think this would help a lot and we would rather not do this change, so. Just wanted to notify the working group, um, and none of us is a native spe speaker, so <laughs> um, yeah, that's it. And the next slide, uh, yeah. So now we, uh, except for the scope issue, then we're basically done, and we would uh, be ready to move move forward with working group plus call, if you think. Thank you. Managed to get all the way through section 3.3. And I don't think you're ready quite yet. <laughs> okay, then we're looking forward to your review, <laughs> Jim. <laughs> Working group last call would be also to get more reviews, obviously. But the point was that we have now addressed all, uh, all reviews that were um, still open. Anyone? Well, so we're asking for um, so reviews. Anyone willing to review that? So the late you just provided the latest version now. Yes, latest version and no update planned. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I will check with Jim. Um, if we're gonna start a working group last call, um, in any case, uh, I will have to to review that, and I'm uh, encouraging all the people to review that um, before or after the working group last call. I think we're pretty close to the end. Um, um, shall we continue or I'll stop the meeting? I'm 
I don't know what the what Jim you think. I have time if other people want to continue. So maybe we can go with the with one last presentation. I mean, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, this was uh, last presented at the virtual meeting we had in April as a replacement for uh, 106. Uh, next, please. Uh, yeah, quick recap. This is a profile of ASK.com. The client requests a token uh, to post at the group manager here acting as resource server and then sends a joining request, getting back in the joint response the key material to use Groupo score. Next, please. Uh, right, uh, since the virtual meeting, we submitted uh, two revisions, uh, version six. Uh, after that, was mostly based on a, a review we got from Jim on version five. Uh, last week, we also submitted a version seven, mostly for alignment with Kikru.com and processing comments um, left from Peter. Um, just as an overview, we have added and registered a group policy. So now the group manager can signal in the joining response that in the group nodes also use the pairwise model group of score recently introduced. And out of discussion with Jim, we also uh, removed an old uh, role combination uh, requester and monitor together because uh, they didn't look really useful anymore for a group member to have. But when doing that, an open point came up. And I have a slide about that later. Uh, we also added the role of verifier. So this is, strictly speaking, not a group member. It doesn't really join the group. But still, it gets an access token to the group manager. And the only thing it is authorized to do after that is sending um, a request to a particular sub resource at the group manager related to that group to retrieve the public keys of the group member and acting as signature verifier for messages that are protected in the group mode of group score. Next slide, please. Yeah, this follows uh, some discussions we had a, a few meetings ago about the parameter that used to be called uh, RS NANS. So other than changing it, its name to KDC Challenge, uh, we changed the text so that it's not a nonce anymore. So as long as the access token uh, that was posted right before returning the response with this parameter is valid, this parameter can in fact be reused several times uh, by the client to produce um, a signature challenge to joining multiple groups uh, under the same token. At some point, based on application policies, the group manager can still uh, invalidate the current KDC challenge value. And well, if that client comes again, uh, it will get first uh, an error response, <clears throat> including a new KDC challenge value to consider from then on uh, for that token. And of course, we have that is security considerations about this nonsense, so to say, uh, used for uh, building signature challenge according to this change. Uh, but about this parameter, again, uh, Jim noted a case where um, a client may not really need it one uh, at all. And the case is where uh, the posted access token specifies for each mentioned group in the token only the role of monitor or only the role of verifier. So for different sub-reasons, in, in this case, the client doesn't need to produce uh, any signature to prove anything. So it doesn't really need to get uh, that value. And of course, the, the group manager can understand if that's the case uh, when processing the access token. Uh, still, we are leaving to the implementer the final choice to take advantage of this um, uh, optimization, so to say, and to not return uh, the KDC challenge in that case. Uh, but in those cases, it wouldn't be of any need anyway for the client. Next slide, please. Uh, right, and the latest update, instead, we have updated the format to uh, the counter signature algorithm used in the group uh, and the related parameters. And this happens in two places, uh, the structure returning response to the 
token post and that just follows ASCII com. And also the corresponding parameters we have later on in the joining response mirrors what we have in respect we are using the COSI capabilities as in the uh, updated COSI registries. Um, update <clears throat> added some the group working process member misses uh, uh, latest routine, so it just remains with um, all key materials. So this node will start receiving messages that it is not to decrypt and validate anymore. At some point it realizes, and it has to go to the group manager to get updated key material. Uh, the problem is that that node can be in multiple groups, and the invalid messages it is receiving may, be, may not include sufficient hints uh, for the node to understand to which exact group it has to point at, at the group manager, if it is a member of multiple groups, or even at, at which exact group manager it should go to if it's under multiple groups of multiple group managers. So as a worst case, of course, it has to try one by one the groups of the different group managers, uh, possibly asking for the key material version number only. And in case of mismatch, go back to that group manager for that group to request the latest key material. But we noticed, and we added in the document, that uh, if the um, group ID used as context ID is formatted in a particular way that we just give as an example in the group score document, uh, the prefix part can give a hint uh, for discriminating between different uh, group managers. OK, next slide, please. And this is the open point we have uh, on the role combination. So we have removed the combination requester monitor. We don't want, doesn't make sense to have a group member into the group with both roles together. Um, the problem is when this should be uh, exactly uh, checked and enforced and by whom. Uh, the way the draft is written now, uh, that's the authorization server. So very early in the workflow, uh, the client requests an access token, and it has to specify uh, a combination of roles that has to be uh, legal already at that point in time. So requester monitor who then be valid. Uh, but then we run into some inconvenience. So uh, think of a node that wants to join the group as requester only first, and then leave it and join it again as monitor only, and the thing should be possible. The way the draft is written now, that node has to ask uh, two different tokens. First as requester only, join as requester, leave, ask the second token as monitor only, post it, join it as monitor, which is pretty inconvenient. We would like to have one token only to be requested and posted. So we propose this change where um, for the authorization server evaluating the access token request, any combination of role is fine at that time as long as there are roles admitted in the profile. Uh, and same for the resource server later on when the token is posted. It's only further later on uh, when the client sends a join request uh, that the group manager checks uh, not only that the role combination of roles uh, match with the token, but also that in that join request, the combination of role is legal. And at that point in Any comments or issues with the possible change? So, um, I don't understand why you think that getting a new token request is a problem in this case. Oh, you can. Uh, I see it as inefficient. I would prefer to request one token only telling me what I can do in the group, not necessarily at the same time. So I would like to postpone that fine grain checking only when the joining request is sent. Okay, I don't think it matters. But that's <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, this level of detail is fine for this document, but the general principle can actually be in ASCII group column, possibly. So 
So basically what you're preventing is that someone goes to the mind and says, yeah, I have all those roles, but I'm speaking under these roles. <laughs> you always take the... If, if, if anyone makes you able to do that request or action, it's going to be valid whatever role is involved. Yes, I would like the token to express everything I can do in the group uh, once and for all. Uh, and then later on, it's up to the group manager to stop me if I try exactly to take a combination that is not legal at that point. It's not that the combination isn't legal, it's that this combination doesn't make a sense. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, to me, I don't object. I don't. Um... It's essentially an optimization to avoid requesting tokens multiple times. Yeah. Otherwise, you have to, the, the way the draft is written now. Anyone has a strong feeling about that? Okay, next slide. Yes, and last one. We expect one more revision before the cutoff, mostly to address this uh, open point. And there is also one small other thing that Jim raised in, in the review of the group manager admin interface, actually. In that document now, we are defining the default values for um, the group parameters describing um, the algorithm, the counter signature algorithm, their parameters. And Jim was suggesting to move uh, the default values for those parameters uh, in this document instead. That should be pretty easy to do. And well, it's just about moving the section here somewhere. Uh, other than that, uh, including this changing, I, I think the document would be pretty stable to go for working group plus school too. And we also want to advance the implementation and plan interrupt tests. Okay. I'd like to see a little bit of interop testing before doing the working group last call. Right. But that's at least good that you think it's a stable version. Yeah. Okay. So, any other comment? I I think we can close the meeting or. I'm fine with that, and I can't give a good presentation in such a time for the next one anyway. So okay. it's fine to stop here. Thanks for the extra time, actually. <laughs> okay, so yeah, the, Jim, do you want to say something to add something? No, I'm fine. Okay, so I think we we have well, we had a, a nice meeting. We. We know we, we, we have homeworks for the next time. Um, so yeah, I think we we know what to do next. And um, thank you for your participation. And see you, I think the next meeting is the ITF meeting. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.